Red 2 standing by, all four litter and in the green, welcome back. Excuse me, welcome back to Pokemon Heart Gold version. I realised I do have to make a couple of little tweaks so that we can proceed on this journey, probably top up on my repels. I need a free slot in my party because otherwise I can't get Tyrogue. Now, interestingly enough, way back in the old days, like actually in Generation 1, you used to be able to switch out which Pokemon you got, to basically choose to send a new Pokemon you got to a box, even if it was a gift. So let's say, for example, you got Lapras in Silphco. It would go straight to your box. In Generation 2 onwards, you actually didn't get to do that. You actually just had to have a free slot in your party. Which makes a lot of things really fiddly. Oh wait, I don't have Sea King. Uh, this should do. I still prefer the Generation 2 and 3 animation for Ice Beam. There's just something a bit more enjoyable about it. The Ice Crystal effect looked really nice. But yeah, so anyway, we're moving on with everything. And today is going to be all about poison type Pokemon. Oh, it must not quite be dark yet. I mean, it looks like it's night, but let's see. Ultra Ball, that ought to do the trick. So, I do have to discuss poison types, which... Well, that was a bit of a surprise. The poison type is kind of an interesting one. It's got a lot of overlap with the water... Well, not water, grass and bug type. So you're going to be seeing a lot of those in there. Speaking of the grass type, I didn't get around to actually doing something that I wanted to bring up, which is the average stats. <coughs> Sorry, something is tickling my throat. The average stats of each Pokemon. So I think they factor in Mega Evolutions and the like. I'm not 100% sure. But they do factor in the... Uh, Regional variants. Anyway, we wound up catching Sea King, so of course I do have to focus on the Pokedex. Sea King, the goldfish Pokemon. During spawning season, Sea King gather from all over, causing rivers to appear a brilliant red. So, the average stats of grass type Pokemon. For all Pokemon, this is factoring in every single grass type Pokemon. Let's at least just wait until we've got into an occasion where I can easily hold up my notes. I don't have anything I can just stash that on. I really should get like a music stand. Grass types have overall an average HP of 66.22. Their attack is 75.33 and their defense not too far behind with 74.1. Their special attack is 71.9 and special defense 71.38. Speed is 59.4. They're probably one of the slower types out there on average. When it goes to full evolutions, they're just under 80 base HP, 79.31. Surprisingly, 94.54 base attack. This was the stat that surprised me the most. 88.85 for their base defense uh, average, so again, they're pretty close. 87.8 average special attack, 84.97 uh, special defense, and 71.75 speed. The full average base stat total is 418.53 and 507.22 for fully evolved Pokemon. Kind of interesting. Probably... Let's... There we are, let's leave that open and we're good to go. So when we move on to the poison type, discussing their stats. So poison types have slightly better average HP overall. 67.55 is the average HP for all poison types. 71.86 is their average physical attack. 67. Point 9.6, sorry my handwriting was slightly terrible, 
is for their defense. Probably should do this off screen. 71.45 is the average for their for their special attack, which means they'll probably hit pretty well from either side. 70.92 is their average special defense. Slightly better on the special defense. And speed is 6. Not too far off the grass type average HP. 66.26. 83.05 for their average maximum HP across all fully evolved poison types. 87.54 average attack, 82.87 average defense, and 88.1 special attack. So, once again, very good all round. 81.72 average special defense. And... No, it's 89.56 average special defense and 81.72 average uh, speed. An exact base stat total of 416 for their average, for their all over average, and 512.84 for their overall fully evolved average. So, interestingly, grass types are a little on the slower side, but do oddly lean to a bit more towards physical attack, which I thought was odd. Whereas the poison type actually has fairly decent special defense, a stat that tends to get overlooked a little bit, but is Apart from maybe slightly lower speed, it's actually very well balanced all round. A pretty useful type all told as far as I'm concerned. Probably put a repel on now. So we've got that interesting little bit of information. We've had some detail about the poison types, but now it's time to rank those poison types. Which is hopefully the bit you've all been waiting for. So, I just sort of started out in general order. We can see Maril in the sunset. Very nice. Don't want to go down there. So, Swalot starts out on D tier. It's not that I don't really like Swalot. I like its design. It looks... It's simple. But it's kind of memorable as well. It's not too, it's not too bad, but I haven't really used it in battle. It was sort of the originator of... Stockpile, Spit Up, and Swallow. A few people had that, but Swallot is probably... Probably commonly associated with that, if it is indeed associated with anything. We'll also be able to get the Dragon Scale in here, by the way. So yeah, Swallot kind of suffers in that regard. So we had our battle over there, and we can start exploring. Galarian, Slowbro, and Slow King, which I haven't really had time to use... They wind up going over there as well. They're sort of in D tier because I haven't really used them. But that said, I'd probably consider using maybe Slow King a bit more. But problem is I don't like Galarian Slow King's design that much. It looks kind of goofy. It looks, well, for me, almost a little over-designed. There's something about the simplicity of of Galarian Slowbro that I like, but then again, neither of them have made a huge impact. Toxicroak also fits down on DT because while it is a pretty solid Pokemon all round, it and it actually bears the distinction of being the only evolution line with a double weakness to Psychic, it's a not it's mostly there because it's not one I've used very much. I mean, if you do wind up bringing a uh, psychic type to combat Toxicroak, it's probably going to have just as many dark type moves it can throw at you, which it's probably quite an embodiment of Game Freak's constant little nerfs to the psychic type. Something I find particularly annoying because I'm a long time psychic type fan, but other types have, have been a lot worse and they still don't get anywhere near as punishment as much punishment as the psychic type seems to continue to. So yeah, Toxicroak is just there mostly because I don't really use it. It's not a bad Pokemon, all things considered. It's just a case of this Pokemon does not catch my attention very much, so it's on that list, which is the other criterion of D tier. Oh wait, I do have to get off here. Nothing up here. Nope, no hidden items. And
And then, then Naganadel, or however it's meant to be pronounced. The one that looks like a blue pot crossed with a B. I don't really like Naganadel. It's just kind of forgettable for me. Again, it's just an yet another legendary Pokemon, like the Ultra Beasts, like the rest of the Ultra Beasts, it is just sort of there. It just sort of felt shoehorned in. I really, really didn't like having it around. And while it's certainly not a horrible Pokemon, it's got an interesting typing, it's just not for me as such. It's really not the sort of Pokemon I'd go out of my way to use. I didn't like the Ultra Beasts in general. Ah, the TM for Aerial Ace, not too bad. So, Naganadel is just sort of one of those Pokemon that's really just there and is not a Pokemon I really like that much. Eternatus also winds up getting on that list. It's... Oh, what does Lyra want? I've already done that, but yeah, anyway. So Eternatus was hyped up as part of the big story. It can be a difficult opponent, I don't deny that, but the problem is, like when you actually battle Eternatus in the story, it's fairly easy to get past under normal circumstances. Then Ah, oh, there's a, an escape road. The the battle you have with it is just... Well, it's a max raid battle, but it's kind of easy. For starters, Eternatus only gets to do one thing a turn. It's, I, as far as I can remember, that's a hard one action a turn. You ha And you have Pokemon which are custom designed to counter it. Basically, this is a pathetic pathetically easy max raid battle. When you consider the bullshit you have to put up with the other raid battles, like the fact that you're dealing with an AI that is as dumb as bricks. Actually, that's quite, quite an insult to bricks. Bricks are road scholars. They are members of Mensa compared to the morons you get if you're unlucky enough to not have any friends, or you're just a horrible person like I am and don't have any friends for that particular reason. I'll probably get more into that particular matter later on. But, like, if you don't have anyone you're playing with, the AI is completely useless. And quite often, there are so many things that just wind up going in the favour of the Gigantamaxed Pokemon, or Dynamax Pokemon, sorry, that it's a nightmare to deal with. We got the Dragon Scale, by the way. Have Cedra hold that? Trade it and you will get Kingdra. If you do actually get to complete a max raid battle and catch whatever you're after, it's almost a miracle. Especially if you're catching a Gigantamax Pokemon. Ugh. It's nearly impossible. But, so Eternatus is kind of a disappointment and it basically exists to counter Gigant Dynamax and Gigantamax Pokemon but that all depends on the species, and it doesn't do jack if the Pokemon you're dealing with has a hard advantage against Eternatus, or again the AI is as dumb as bricks and doesn't help you out. It's just so, it's so irritating. It represents a lot of the problems, found an Aether, that's nice. It represents a lot of the problems with Sword and Shield in a way. And I mean, I've got things I like, but it's just... <sighs> Eternatus was an interesting idea that was kind of a total fizzer in the end. Having ranted about that, there is poor old Quillfish, which really could be made into a more interesting Pokemon and kind of a nice alternative to uh, Tentacool and Tentacruel. If you buffed its stats a little bit, it could be really nice, but as it is, it's just sort of... A, it's average... And B, good luck finding it. Because without Fisher Ralph and bringing in the swarms, you can't really find it. And it's probably not worth searching for. Because 
it's good, but it, there are so many just good water types out there. Quillf you will probably wind up forgetting Quillfish exists, and that's kind of sad. It's very unfortunate, really. So after Quillfish is Dustox, which is... Well, it's an early game bug Pokemon, and it's a bug poison type. A lot of elements which had been done before. It's helpful early on. There's absolutely no denying that it's pretty helpful in the early game of uh, Ruby and Sapphire, especially when it comes to fighting Brawly, on account of the fact it has a four times resistance to fighting moves, which can actually make dealing with Brawly's Pokemon really handy. So it's a nice crutch, but eventually as you get stronger and build up, you will get to the point where you don't need that crutch. And that's going to be it. Dustox isn't going to be very helpful. Found another Max Revive. So yeah, Dustox is not that great. Then for the same reasons that I don't really like uh, Naganadel, I don't like Nihiligo either. It's part of a nice story thread, but it's just, I don't know, I don't think they did enough with it. There were some cool concepts in there, I'm not going to lie. But I think it was also kind of wasted potential. It's got an interesting type combination, but I think there was... I don't know, something about it does ju just doesn't gel right. And then finally, we'll finish up the D tier before we speak to the Karate King is Toxtricity. Poison Electric, interesting combo. Big problem with ground types, absolute... Pain in the ass Gigantamax form, because if its attack, it's if its G-Max attack hits just one opponent, everyone in the raid cops a status condition. And if you don't wind up getting the status condition, because say you're a poison type or you're an electric type, you get the one that does affect you. It's, and this is if everyone effect is affected. I think it's an electric type move. So you need to have a full team of ground types or this will hit everyone. Because if you bring a ground type, you don't get hurt, but your dumbass allies get hurt, you cop the status conditions along with them. It's guilt by association. It's got kind of a nice gimmick in terms of how its different forms have different... wind up having a slightly different abilities based on the nature. Now that would probably elevate it to a high D tier. A D plus, perhaps, because it's a really cool concept that has never been used before. And it should be built on. This would add just a little bit more to various Pokemon. But they didn't. Anyway. Hey! I am the Karate King. I train alone here in the cave. You, battle with me. Hwa! And with that, we can move on to... The C tier, which starts off with Arbok. Black Belt Keo is our Karate King, and he has Hitmonlee like he did in Days of Yore. If you've beaten Claire, which you need to to get Waterfall, as you can see, you are not going to have a difficult time. Oh well, guess you saw that coming. Anyway, Arbok sits in C tier, probably because a bit of nostalgia... Probably because a bit of versatility. It's a pretty cool Pokemon. It doesn't... Artificial stupidity, everyone. So Arbok is a pretty cool Pokemon. It has a nice design and it's kind of underrated in one sense. Or at least it, one of its abilities is too understated because it doesn't actually utilise... The fact that, according to the Pokedex, its patterns change based on where it's found. Now, this would be a right pain in the backside to actually sort out. I can imagine it would be a bit bothersome, but, like, let's say if you found an Arp if Mbok in, uh, in Kanto, l letting it have a different uh, pattern to one you found in Johto or something like that would be really neat. And, like... If you've got parents from Kanto and, say, Sinnoh, then there's a possibility of a Sinnoh pattern coming on the kids. 
that would be really nice. But it's, it's mostly nostalgia and a bit of versatility along the way that gets Arbok into C tier. Another snake pops up, which I suppose is appropriate because I'm Australian, and we have some of the world's deadliest or most venomous snakes going around. I think it had something like, Australia has something like 9 of the top 10 deadliest snakes in the world and 9 of the top 9. This is unsurprising, Australia is trying to kill you on a daily basis. Winter is safe, mostly. Mind you, that still doesn't mean that a, tr a tree can't just randomly shed a branch, but... So, we've got Tyrogue, which can evolve into Hitmonlee, Hitmonchan, or Hitmontomp, depending on stats. Higher attack at level 20, Hitmonlee. Higher defense, Hitmonchan. And go even for Hitmontomp. So, Surviper is a pretty cool Pokemon with a really nice tie-in to Zangus. It's basically... It the idea is that it's supposed to be based on the Mongoose and the Cobra, but Surviper is quite clearly a different kind of Viper. It's based on a type of Viper, I think it's the uh, Habu or something like that. It's a, Anyway, it's a Japanese, it appears somewhere in Japan. But the idea was that these particular snakes would actually wind up being pitted against uh, Mongooses in fights because it was a bigger challenge for the Mongoose because they knew how to slip past Cobras. They were fighting fresh new opponents and this made an interesting fight. So Surviper has a cool backstory. But it... Oh hello, it's top percentage Rattata guy again, is it? Oh, he wants to battle! Alright, well I'm happy to give him a battle. He's a good kid and I'm certainly happy that he's really passionate about his Pokémon. Now if we go this way, we can find an item via rock smash, rock, rock climb, sorry. This also takes us to the first area of Mount Mortar. So, easy way to get out. Assuming I go the right way. But we at least got that sorted out, and we've claimed Tyrogue, so we can quickly pop that in the box. I can get my... I can get Hedwig back, and we can get to flying. So yeah, Surviper's an interesting Pokémon, just not used enough. Garboda is next, and it's partly in C tier because of pure spite. Just to annoy everybody who thinks it sucks because it's a walking pile of trash. Partly because it is actually a pretty well-balanced Pokémon with some interesting abilities, but it's one that I don't really get to use a lot. It does sort of play an important role because it plays the land pollution role to Coughing's air pollution and to Grimer's water pollution. So it's really neat in that regard. I just think it's an enjoyable Pokémon that I would like to use a bit more often. Then we go to Skuntank, which I have used a bit, and it gets a few points for being a Poison Dark type. This is a fair advantage for it. It's only got one weakness, and that's to ground, so while it's not the most defensively... not the greatest defensive specialist, it's still a pretty good Pokémon, all things considered, and has some pretty good tricks up its sleeve, like learning Flamethrower upon evolution. And, of course, it can... It has a cry that sounds like a fart if you really want to get into those slightly immature jokes. So you got that going for it, but overall it's a pretty neat Pokémon with some fairly interesting tactics. Not too shabby, but it has been a while since I've used it, so I'm probably a bit rusty on it. Let's get over to Sinewood and check out the waterfalls around here. Then there's Salazzle, which has an interesting ability. It can poison steel types, but that's all it can do. It can poison them, and other poison types. Poison attacks will still be not very effective against other poison types, and they won't affect steel types at all. Aside from that, while it is a fairly handy Pokémon with good special attacks, some neat moves, good speed, it's also a little disturbing in some ways, and it's also a pain in the ass to actually get hold of, because it has the same issue as Vespaquin. It's 
basically a one basically one in eight shot of getting one that will evolve which sucks now there are some female only species of lizards along the way that essentially that have some version of asexual reproduction so Salazzle could well be based on those which makes for an interesting scientific observation but overall pain in the ass to get in a Pokemon game at least it's a decent Pokemon and then like the grass type Amoongus makes seat here because memes then we get Muck not a bad Pokemon, pretty solid physical hitter, and actually really good HP and special defense. So it'll soak up those special attacks pretty well. We've got a patch of grass in which we can train here, so... What level are the Pokemon in here? Let's take a look. That's right, I put the repel on. So we'll just have to run around like an idiot a little bit. And yeah, then we can talk about Drapion, which is basically same type as Skuntank, Poison Dark, evolving from the Bug, bug Poison Scorpy. Oh, they actually are a little bit stronger. This might be a better level grinding spot if we need to. Well, we might as well get Angela up to uh, level 42 while I talk. So yeah, Drapion is a pretty solid Pokemon, decent attack, good defense, reasonable speed, not too shabby all round. Might look odd, but it can actually be pretty useful. Oh, that worked very nicely. So yeah, it's a pretty dependable Pokemon. Given that it only has that one weakness, you can get a fair bit of mileage out of it. And yeah, overall just a very so very solid, very helpful Pokemon. It can learn a pretty good variety of moves along the way, like it can you can reteach it Thunder Fang and Ice Fang and Fire Fang, I think. Get stuff like Crunch and Poison Jab, so really worth a go as far as I'm concerned. Dragalge is another one that sits in B but could jump up close to A. It's the first poison dragon type. It evolves from the water poison Skrelp. It's a pretty solid special defender, great special attack, and an interesting attempt at countering fairy types for the dragons. It's a, so it's a solid enough Pokemon, it has a really neat design being based on the Weedy Sea Dragon, so it sort of follows the same principle as Horsey, Cedra, and Kingdra in Seahorse becoming a dragon. This one just has a slightly more recognizable and fancier style. It's got a really nice design. I do love the way it looks. And it's a solid and dependable Pokemon all round, which while it's difficult to get your hands on it, is just a good Pokemon. Is there anything we can pick up around here? Yep, we've gone all the, this way for the White Flute. Which I think helps keep Pokemon away, or does it attract them? Yep, Black Flute keeps them away. So, that's okay, but really. So yeah, Dra Dragalge, pretty good Pokemon, good moves at its disposal, worth a go now and then if you do manage to get hold of Skrull. Then we've got Tox Apex, another water poison type that is all about defense, poisoning opponents and then smacking them around on the counter attack. It's a pretty solid Pokemon if used correctly. It can actually be pretty solid in quite a lot of uh, tournaments as far as I know, but it's also just really good on a casual run. It doesn't hit hard, but its ability to cripple any Pokemon that winds up getting poisoned, especially if it has the Merciless ability, allowing it to always score a critical hit on a poisoned Pokemon, makes it really, really worth your while. Played right, it can tank shots, dish out a bit of damage in return, and just steadily cripple opponents. I find that one a really good choice along the way. I used it for a bit in, uh, in Sun and Moon, and it was well worth it. May not be quite what you're looking for, but it's worth a go if you know how to use your competitive teams. 
and then we wind up getting good old Vile Plume. Vile Plume's just sort of there for similar reasons, something I'd like to use but probably don't use anywhere near as much. So probably not a lot of explanation to wind up making about Vile Plume, if I'm going to be honest. Which is kind of unfortunate. Then we move on to the A tier, and quite obviously, Nido King and Nido Queen are solid A tier. They are so dependable, so versatile, so useful, it can almost be unfair using one in a run, because you are always, always going to have a solid and dependable Pokemon on your team. They're just amazing, honestly. The fact they have so many moves available to them, so much coverage, they can be available early, and as long as you've got TMs, they're good. They're really something. They are absolutely brilliant, and it's well worth using them, and then try not to use them, because once you want to once you use them, you probably won't want to use too much. Great for speed runs. And let's see. Worth noting that Nido King does have slightly better offenses, but Nido Queen has slightly better defenses. They are really well balanced. If we do head into the dance theatre. How? How is this possible? How can I lose to mere kimono girls? You were watching me, Tom? Yeah, that's right. Never thought defeating five kimono girls would be so hard. I got beaten to a pulp. You must have come here for the same reason, right? Don't get cocky just because you defeated Team Rocket. These kimono girls are insanely strong. Go ahead. See if you can defeat them. But I'm not going back. I don't want to see you win. And off we go, the development continues. Lovely little touches like that. We didn't have much to do here first time, but now we can take on all five Kimono Girls. Zuki is our first opponent, the very first one we met. So that was where we got the egg. Uh, don't tell them what I've done with it. It's mostly just sort of festering in the box. Well, five battles in a row. Let's get rocking and or rolling. I think she has Umbreon first up. We're going to use the five evolutions of the time at of gold and silver. They're, you sort of battled them as optional opponents in... Uh, well, they weren't optional in the original games because you needed to beat them to get Surf. They were around about level 17 or so, but still pretty strong Pokemon. Their movesets weren't great, though. Got the confusion from Signal Beam. So after those ones is Crobat. Crobat is so dependable. If you're really good at raising your Pokemon, you can get that happiness up. Crobat's easy to get hold of. Keep working on that happiness, and you've got a Pokemon with pretty decent attack and amazing speed and some pretty good moves along the way. With the right setup, and even with some good moves spread onto it, Crobat is a force to be reckoned with. It won't ever hit super hard, but that high speed can disorient opponents and take them down really easily. It's quite a good Pokemon. It's so easy to get in the majority of the games. On top of that, it's just worthwhile all the way. I cannot recommend it highly enough, really. As you can see, we're facing Naoko, and the the Pokemon that is next on my list of uh, ra poison rankings is the Pokemon I'm using. Good old Venomoth. I just love this Pokemon. It probably could jump up to the S tier in all fairness. It's good enough to be there. I r just really like having it around. It's a strong, solid Pokemon that has gradually got a bit better as the generations have improved. It's got better moves available to it. It's uh, been able to use its special attack a bit better. Mm. 
probably have to heal up after this one unless random damage permutations knock me out. Oh well, now we need to heal. But yeah, basically, Venomoth and, I mean, the fact that Venomoth got Quiver Dance. Venomoth is not game-breaking, but it's useful. The fact it gets Quiver Dance and, can, and it can do so much with that is a real boon to it. It's never going to set the world on fire, but it's just a good, solid, dependable Pokemon, and I do encourage... And there's the knockout from the critical hit. God damn it. Well, that's a Pokemon game for you. That's rough. But yeah, Venomoth is just, it's just a pretty solid Pokemon if you want something for a good regular run, really. Victory Bells are also on the list because of everything I talked about uh, with Ellington, my, uh, my shiny Victory Bell. That was the first time I actually found a shiny Pokemon in a Johto game because I don't count the Red Gyarados. Ellington's just been pretty solid, and I'm really sad I can't take him over to a Generation 8 Pokemon game, and on top of that, I can't actually get him out of Pokemon Home and send him back to the 3DS games like some of the other Pokemon I want to keep. That's kind of bothersome. So now we'll be uh, facing uh, Flareon, I think. So I think we're facing the EV Lucians in reverse Pokedex order. So yeah, Ariados is also on the list. I like Ariados. I don't know why it is that I seem to be attracted to that particular early game bug Pokemon, but Ariados is just solid and dependable all the way. At least I find it to be so. Probably going to need Angela for this one. It's... Well, dependable for a while. I mean, Arik stuck around with us for a fair bit, so I can't exactly complain about Arik's service. That was excellent. I just like Ariados, and I wish that it actually had a better run of things. That's probably one of the things that bugs me, if I can use that terrible pun, but some of those early game bugs do deserve a better run. They deserve a bit of an improvement. Like, Ariados can get some pretty interesting moves. Like, the fact it's a spider means it can get Electro Web. But it can't do anything with that, because its special attack is terrible. It does have fairly decent attack, and but it's pretty slow. Just overall, I really wish there was something more for it, because they have shown what they've done with something a bit later on, and that worked really well. So really, Ariados deserves a bit better, I think. Oh, it gets to live with 1 HP. That's the way it goes, though. You face a full health knockout, you're gonna die. The AI faces a full health knockout, survives with 1 HP. How many times has that happened? That's happened so much playing uh, through Black version. It's like, okay, am I gonna get this KO? Nope, it is surviving with 1 HP left. And that is an unbelievable bother. But, all well and good. All sorted. So yeah, Ariados, nice Pokemon, some interesting moves. Should be a lot better than it currently is. It would be nice to see a lot of Johto Pokemon improved. But speaking of improvements, Roselia into Roserade. Roserade is the top of the list. And one of only two Pokemon, which can be fully evolved at level one. It is a solid Pokemon all the way. It's not super sturdy, as you might expect, but it's reasonably fast, and it's got really, really good special special attack on top of that. I think it had, for a time, it had the highest special attack of any poison type. Might have been that, or it might have tied for the highest of any grass type. Oh, now the fun begins. All right, well, I'm going... If you're going to do that, I'm just going to keep using Sleep Powder until one of these hits. This is why Clear Smog is such a good move. Or I need Haze.
Oh, th this is a nightmare. Why is it just spamming double team? Like this is the sort of this is the sort of thing that gets you banned. Right, that's it. We're switching. This is the sort of thing that winds up getting you banned from competitive play by forcing everything to be a luck-based mission. Sucks to be you. Maximum evasion. My moves will only hit one third of the time. As to how you can avoid an earthquake, I don't know. Jeez, it's just... There we are. Dodge that. But yeah, Roserade, really solid Pokemon. Great to use. And the way you can get it at level 1 is if you breed a standard Roselia. I believe you need the Rose Incense in order to get Badu. Otherwise, you will get Roselia. So if you use a Shiny Stone on that, then uh, Rose then you will have a level 1 Roserade. The only other Pokemon which can be a level 1 fully evolved, legitimately, is Porygon Z, because it requires two trade evolutions. Last one, and last one for the AT is Scolipede. Scolipede, along with Lee Vanny, which I actually completely forgot about, Kinda of forgot Levani was no wait, Levani's in bug, sorry, it's bug grass. I stuck it down in D tier. Scolopede, I just love the design. I found it a really fun Pokemon to use. And the fact it gets speed boost can be a real benefit for it. It showed the world, along with Levani in all fairness, and pretty much all of Generation 5's bug types, that being crap was not the rule rather than the exception. These were seriously good Pokemon, and Scolopede was my favourite of the lot. It's based on a type of giant centipede, Scolopendra, and it's just all around super dependable, really fun to have around. It's a pretty capable Pokemon. It doesn't hit super hard. I think it did get a bit of a buff to its attack. Pretty good speed, good attack, and just really worth a go all around as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, Scolopede is a very good Pokemon. Scolopede and Ariados would probably knock on the door of S tier. And of course now I have to complain because I got a critical hit going my way. And Mothala is level 42. I'll have to give the rare candy to uh, Hestia. Because I'm going to need Hestia for the plan ahead. So we have managed to acquire the clear bell which will allow us to call upon ho -Oh when we reach the top of the bell tower. Looks like ho has come back. We'll have to go and do some preparation. Well done, everyone. Oh yes, we can actually fix this up too. So I'll go for what I assume. I've probably been going for about half an hour around about this point. Because it didn't take me too long to get through uh, Mount Mortar with repels on. So let's go heal my team. We'll get this. And the rare candy goes to Hestia. So, we will wind up finding Rattatas and Ghastly in the Bell Tower. But they're all around about level 20 rather than being much higher level, perhaps because we could access it a lot earlier. So, we heal up, we go grab some Dusk Balls because as far as I'm concerned they're not cheating, and we move on to the battle. So yeah, S tier wheezing automatically makes it. Really good Pokemon, surprisingly versatile, can hit fairly well from either attacking side, great defense. A bit on the slow side, HP's not fantastic, but overall it's just a really solid Pokemon. I like its design, it's simple, but immediately memorable, and interestingly, Coughing actually had a slight change in its design shown in its sprite for red and blue version, one that didn't wind up taking off, obviously because it was a complete miscue. Coughing was shown with its skull above its face, the little skull and crossbones design it has, rather than below it, 
in all its other art. This was... This... I don't know why it wound up having that happen, but overall, it actually kind of made a pretty cool touch, but... We have the coughing we all know and love. I absolutely loved Galarian Wheezing. Its design looked... Oh, wait, hang on. Oh, you're still there from earlier. You'll probably disappear when we wind up clearing the... Uh... Uh... There we go. So yeah, she disappears after you beat the Kimono Girls, but... Yeah, I love the design of Galari and Weezing. It was just the right mix of interesting and well interesting and well researched and completely ridiculous. It definitely conjures up the idea of the classic British gentleman. You cross that with the factory smokestacks of industrial London and the air pollution, and probably unfortunate references to bongs along the way. And you've got one interesting Pokemon that as a poison fairy type, the first kind and first of its kind, is actually pretty solid with some good moves along the way. So, in all fairness, good Pokemon. I cannot praise it highly enough. The fact that it can have levitate really makes it useful. It reduces it down to one weakness. It's psychic type weakness, though there are more weaknesses, well a couple more anyway, for Galarian Weezing. If it's got Levitate though, it's weak to Psychic and Steel, which is overall not too bad, but then again it can pack Flamethrower to deal with those pesky fire types. Better grab some more repels too. Overall this is a solid Pokemon with some pretty interesting moves along the way and some great opportunities. It definitely is worth a go. Then there's good old Venusaur, which is just incredibly dependable, really solid, got me through plenty of runs on the old games. Just can't praise it enough, really. Again, it's that same situation. It's just a solid all-round Pokemon, which has picked up some really nice tricks and better moves as the generations have gone on. And while I don't think it's a competitive darling, it has for me, it's always remained relevant and particularly useful along the way. Then we have Beedrill. I absolutely love Beedrill. I don't know why, there's something that, about its design that just winds up sticking with me. It's just really, really... I don't know, it's just stuck with me. It's a perfect example of how Mega Evolutions should have been done. Giving that Pokemon that's not so good a new lease on life. It's not exactly, like, utterly game-breaking. But it's just such a good Pokemon. It can hit so hard, so fast, and dish out a lot of damage. And every time we come to the Bell Chime Trail, I mean, just look at this area! This discon this little side area that we don't really need to go to, apart from this one story element. Look at the detail in that! Look at the passion! This... Like, they really, really cared about these games. They really cared about the uh, DS era games. Not that there aren't people who... Not that there aren't people who care on the new games, but you can sort of tell where some of the... Com where the company's cutting corners. Like, if I can divert for a minute, like... James Turner's art direction. Sword and, for Sword and Shield. I love James Turner's art direction. I love the design of the characters. I love the design of the Pokemon. And I love the overall feel of the Galar region. But they didn't necessarily do enough. The graphics... I don't care as much about the graphics, but I know there are some things that are lacking. I'm going to admit that. And I don't think they did enough to bring the UK to life. The short routes I could take. But they didn't add all the little opportunities to go off those roads and find interesting things because you drive within 20 miles like say a 20 mile diameter in the UK you're probably going to find several towns a few small villages and maybe something interesting and historical 
or at the very least it's going to have some historical significance for the locals, like a notable church. Here in Australia, you drive twenty mi- drive within a 20 mile diameter and you're lucky if you get to where you're going. But yeah, Beedrill, really, sol- really solid mega evolution, just nice design, all round. I'd see, again, I just wish it was better, but that mega evolution made it the better it needed to be. And as a result, solid Pokemon, I just like having it around. And then the last one in S tier is, of course, the Ghost with the Most. Gengar has been a top Pokemon for quite some time. And ultimately, they had to give it Cursed Body instead of Levitate because this thing was too broken. Three immunities was quite daunting. There was a lot to get past when you dealt with Gengar. And while it's not quite as broken as it used to be, its Mega Evolution is an absolute terror. Gengar is still really solid, really dependable, and you can't quite go wrong with it. It's been a top-notch Pokemon for so long, and it's just a hell of a lot of fun to have around. It's my brother's favourite Pokemon, and I definitely enjoy having it around as well. I love using it, even though Alakazam's always going to be my favourite. Gengar definitely deserves a spot as an S-tier poison type. The list of poison types is not quite as extensive. But, there we are. Hestia is pretty happy and I'm glad to have her around. I'm going to wind up wrapping this episode up with a big, big showdown. Need to get back over to that side. We have a, quite a few items to grab here in the bell tower. Which I think used to be referred to as the Tin Tower. I think you had the Tin Tower, which is now known as the Bell Tower, and the Brass Tower, which is the one that burned down. So yeah, I've probably used quite a few Poison-type Pokémon along the way. They're decent. They're not outstanding Pokémon, but t- unless you count the Ultra Beasts. Poison did not actually have a legendary Pokémon. Until Generation 7, no legendary Pokemon were poison types, and even then I don't truly consider the Ultra Beasts to be legendary Pokemon. Not in the traditional sense, anyway. So we probably still don't have a real legendary Pokemon for them, but we do have something neat anyway. That's not it. Must be the other one. Being able to hear the creaking of the pillar in the middle is pretty cool. So yeah, Poison has always been a bit hard done by. It used to be super effective against Bug in the in Generation 1. Oddly enough, Bug was also super effective to Poison. There is not really an explicable... It's not really explicable, if I'm going to be honest. Alright, so we need to come in from a different angle. So yeah, that one was really strange. It would have left Paris and Parasect with three double weaknesses. Which would kind of suck. Kind of, well, probably would have sucked. We'll need to battle Joey too. Right, so we'll have to battle Jack and Joey after this. That'll be a good wind down for what I'm planning. So we'll slowly make our way here, battle ho and then go and battle the Rattata guy and a schoolboy. What a great way to wrap up a battle against a legendary Pokemon than with a Rattata. It is Eradicate by now, I think. But yeah, because of that particular issue, Poison lost that advantage against uh, Bug. Which I suppose is okay, because insects in real life can wind up overcoming pesticides. But it also created real problems for type balance. I should have gone down that way. Because poison, it kind of needed... I didn't want to go back up the ladder. I thought I went to the side. Poison kind of needed some extra advantages. 
I maintain that it should be super effective against water or say against the fighting time to improve balance because it's like it's either polluting water or not even the strongest warrior can withstand a potent venom. Little touches like that, like you could make a few changes along the way, but overall, overall I do think Poison having an advantage against Teferi was good, it does need a bit more to it than that, but I think that's wishful thinking right now, they've probably messed with the type chart enough. So yeah, I think Poison is one of the most common types seen in the hands of antagonists. Usually winds up populating basic villain teams and now we've got teleporters. Most villains are going to have the Zubat line somewhere along the way, Team Rocket tends to use Poison types. Plumeria of Team Skull uses Poison types. There weren't that many Poison type experts in the series. Because we we know Koga, who was a gym leader and then an Elite Four member, with Janine becoming a gym leader in his in his stead. Then we didn't have another poison type specialist until Generation Five, when Roxy turned up and then Plumeria turned up. So it's kind of interesting that Koga is the only male poison type specialist. A little unusual, perhaps, but still pretty neat. Gotta loop around a fair bit to get here. Up. Ah, went too far again. Oh, running in circles, that's pretty much the story of my life. Yeah, that, that brings up kind of an interesting matter. I was saying that the poison type was appropriate because... Well, I suppose I've been feeling like a particularly poisonous person of late. Not that I want to, but... Oh, that just took me here. It's more that... In trying to change, I wind up making a lot of the same mistakes over and over again, and that's... Well, it's obviously disheartening because for the people for whom I've promised I'd change... It winds up just creating even more issues because, well, it shows to them that I, at least I think it shows to them that I'm not very sincere at all. Which, of course, is not my intention, but I have such a bad habit of holding on to all those little frustrations. I don't really have a good way to get all that frustration out. And I think that winds up making me a bad person that I haven't learned from those mistakes that I haven't really changed and I need a lot more help than I think I do. I don't really want to mess things up for people. That's quite understandable. Nobody does. I just do kind of wish that I could find an easy solution to a lot of things and I know that n not very many of them are easy solutions because like, part of the reason I tend to get annoyed and occasionally vent frustrations is because... Well, first off, I'm the sort of person for whom perfection, or at the least doing very well... ...is treated as the absolute minimum, the least I should be doing. Right, so that takes us out. Is there an item back there? So it can often be quite frustrating if, I, if I'm not doing well. And... If I'm getting stressed out by something by life because, unfortunately, there are lots of situations that are difficult but I don't feel I can talk about easily. Something little, something as innocuous as my friends just being better at a game than me. That can be the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't have any reason to get mad at them. Is there an item behind here? No, I thought there was. But yeah, I don't have any reason to get mad at them. I don't want to and then then it just all goes wrong. But I do keep doing the same thing over and over again, and I really do need 
a lot more help than I think. It's like, I don't want to make mistakes, I don't want to have relapses, but if I let my guard down, I do, and I find that so hard to forgive. I find that, I find that it just makes me a terrible person. Because I'm not doing what I said I would. I'm not keeping those promises. I'm taking the steps to be a lot better, but I still have a very, very long way to go, and I can only just hope that I haven't managed to push people away through my own stupidity, that people will want to stick around. I wasn't in a good headspace when I recorded Metroid Prime, and the result is a project I don't like. I know I'm not in the best headspace now, but I'm being honest with myself and with everyone else. And if that can move me forward, then this little recession has helped. Let's call down ho -Oh. Somehow, I think this scene is more majestic at night. No matter what, given the beauty of the bell chime trail, it looks amazing. So we've made ho -Oh appear. And now I'm going to save, because we're catching this thing. Here atop the bell tower, this is why I brought Hestia, because she shrugs off sacred fire. And she can't be burned. 50% chance of burning. Let's rock and or roll. I'm not sure what the time is, but we're getting a bit of a long one today. Let's get going. Uh, one step forward. The music for this absolutely rocks. The mighty guardian of the skies versus a volcanic snail. Sunny day, bumping up the power of its fire moves. It also packs extra sensory and I think safeguard. Or it might have recover, I'm not sure. I think it has safeguard. So I'm probably going to want to stack yawn on it. Still a fair bit of damage, but... So, let's just keep chipping away at it. Ho-Oh actually has a remarkable 130 base attack and 154 base special defense, much like Lugia does. Lugia also has base 130 defense, so it's an absolute fortress. Especially if you get one with multi-scale. Oh boy. Well, that didn't do very much. Well, it's asleep, so let's chip away at it with Flamethrower. This is basically a battle of patience. When I did this last time, I caught Ho-Oh in one Dusk Ball. I don't think I'm going to get that lucky this time. One more Lava Plume more to set it right in that zone.
All right, we're in the butter zone. Let's put it to sleep. Extra sensory is another trick in its move pool. Righto, probably better heal Hestia because extra sensory does a fair bit of damage. Magcargo's special attack, special defense is not fantastic. And Ho-Oh doesn't have a great wide-reaching move pool. Sunny Day and Sacred Fire both only have 5 PP. Seems intent on setting up the sun. Alright, it's catching some Zeds. Hopefully we're catching Ho-Oh. I think Ho-Oh is just too slow for the fastball to have effectiveness. Its space speed is 90, I believe, so we couldn't replicate the legendary feat from last time. Let's hope this works. Ugh. There we are, come on. Yeah, not going as well as last time. We must have got insanely lucky. I suppose I could start moving on to bug types if this uh, drags on long enough. Yeah, this is where having the stylus comes in handy if I have to do all this manually. <sighs> Two, we're getting closer. At least it stayed asleep for a while. But yeah, the only surefire methods... Well, there's a lot of luck involved. That's all I'll say. There is no surefire method apart from the Master Ball, and I'm not wasting that on Ho-Oh. If I run into a roaming Pokemon, then we are using it. Okay, so... That was four turns. I know that sleep is four turns. Alright, we flinched. Extra sensor. Oh, fire blast, that's other move. Still gonna have to heal Hestia, so this thing does not have a lot of PP outside extra sensory. This is going to be a really interesting battle, especially... Well, once it runs out of fire moves, I actually think Peony, who has light screen, is my best bet. But yeah, overall, you cannot underestimate Ho-Oh's power. Interestingly, Ho-Oh, Lugia, and Mewtwo all have the same individual base stat totals, they're just distributed differently. So Ho-Oh, I believe, has it has base 100 HP, base 130 spe base 130 physical attack, which is Mewtwo's base speed. It has 90 base defense, which is the same as Mewtwo. It has 110 base special attack, which is the same as uh, Mewtwo's physical attack. It has 154 base special defense, the same as Mewtwo's special attack and oh close it has 90 base speed which is the same as Mewtwo's special defense Lugia I think also has 100 base HP but it has 90 base attacking stats which are the same as Mewtwo's defenses it has 130 base def defense switched with Mewtwo's speed because Mewtwo has yeah, so base 130 defense, Mewtwo's speed is base 130, Ho Lugia's speed is base 110, and the 154 special defense as well. I hope that made sense. Because it's interesting to know that the starters of Kanto and Johto actually have the same base stat totals, they're just distributed slightly differently in the case of, uh, of Meganium and Venusaur and for Alligator and Blastoise. For example, Blastoise has slightly better special defense, whereas for Alligators, I think, switches with its attack. For Alligator has the base 105 uh, physical attack, slightly lower 
slightly lower special defense. I think it swaps the special attack and special defense stats around from Blastoise. It's definitely not cooperating this time. At least it gives me a bit more to talk about. So yeah, Meganium swaps special attack with... Uh, Meganium swaps defense and special attack, basically. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same as Venusaur. Interestingly enough, Charizard and Typhlosion have the exact same base stat total distribution. Everything is identical. Kind of a fun bit of trivia. I'm going to try again. And just hope I don't get KO'd. Paralysis at least lasts longer. Oh, this is actually starting to turn a little arduous. I think I'm going to have to fast forward this. Well, talk about your sunk cost fallacy. We're coming back to that in the next episode. Bugger. Right here amid stony silence, this is Red 2 limping back to base. I did save before this thing, right?